here. Um, who's going to give us an overview of CASTEP and in particular CASTEP developments to use GPUs. Um, so Bill is based on the N8 system. Um, and as far as I understand, the bead part, which is the GPU um, part in particular. Um, but as part of a kind of crossover between the various tier twos, we'll be showing us how to use CASTEP GPUs on the young cluster. So um, yeah, I think this is going to be really relevant. We've got a lot of users of CASTEP. I think it's one of our top five new softwares. So um, hopefully this, this will be a very useful talk to, to many of our users um, and hopefully the first many crossover talks. Uh, so thank you. I'll pass over. Thank you very much. So I, ho I hope this is useful as well. Um, so we're not going to be able to show you uh, the cast up running on GPU directly on Young. We were trying that this morning and we haven't quite got it. So we're going to have to write um, some better documentation. So we'll do that for you. What's just There we go. Is that better? So uh, we're going to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on what CASTEP is and what it does and how CASTEP is currently used on CPU clusters, how it's parallelized, what kind of performance you can expect. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Matt Smith, and he's going to talk to you about the work that we've been doing to port CASTEP to GPUs. Again, uh, what works, what's, uh, what sort of speed ups you can expect, and what is still work in progress. So I don't think for this audience I really need to labour this point, but just to start, there are many problems that we face in society that are really materials problems, or at least that materials can help to address. And I imagine many people are familiar with these issues. So how do we generate electricity without using fossil fuels? How do we store the energy uh, efficiently? How do we recover lost energy, which is typically as, as heat? How do we design our devices in the first place so that they use energy more efficiently? And increasingly, how can we improve our healthcare and our pharmaceuticals in a way that involves perhaps less trial and error and less investment of time. And this broadly goes by materials or molecular modeling, but the word materials I think is quite misleading because really we go back to the word matter where materials comes from and anything involving atoms, we generally say is a material. So you wanna study the core of Jupiter, it's a material. You wanna study, uh, study uh, gaseous, methane, it's a material. We'd use this very, very broadly, anything that involves uh, atoms, really. And there are lots of different ways of doing materials modeling. So if you're in the field, you will probably know there are things like classical interatomic force fields, and you might be familiar with packages like LAMPS or DL Poly or Gromax or Amber. These are ways of generating forces on atoms according to a, a function which takes the positions and tells you what the forces are. So they've been very carefully parameterized, often for particular classes of material like uh, semiconductors, particular uh, hybrid, chemical hybridizations. There are also what are known as first principles modeling methods. I've highlighted three here. So Quantum Monte Carlo, we have a number of people on the Young Machine doing Quantum Monte Carlo, which attempts to solve the many body Schrodinger equation. There are some many body perturbation theory approaches like GW, you may know the Questile code. And then the one that we're going to focus on today is known as DFT or density functional theory. And it's the theory uh, that's used by a whole range of quantum chemistry and solid state physics programs. I've highlighted CASTEP, CP2K, and VASP here as typically the top three codes used on UK computers, uh, large computers. But there are others, Quantum Espresso and Abinet are the ones that are most similar to CASTEP and VASP, but there's Crystal. And you, if you're from chemistry, you may know codes such as Gaussian, or uh, there are a whole, whole slew of them, NWChem, and so on. So we're going to focus on DFT, and I'm a developer of the CASTEP program, so I'm going to mostly talk about CASTEP. 
But if you want to ask me more, you're very welcome. But this is the subject of our spotlight today. So the aim is to predict the behavior of materials from first principles, in other words, without having to do this parameterization, without having to know it's a metal or it's a semiconductor or it's a, a nano ribbon or whatever it might be. And we use the fact that all of these materials are made of atoms whose chemical and electronic properties are dominated by the electrons. And electrons, we know we can model accurately using quantum mechanics. The key idea here is that this is a predictive simulation. So the behavior of a material and the qualities of the material should emerge from the simulation. We shouldn't have to put them in beforehand. So if it's a, if it's a metal, the simulation should tell us it's a metal. We should discover that it conducts electricity. Um, if it's a, an insulator, we should discover that. We should discover that it takes uh, significant energy to excite the electrons in that material. This is my cartoon for what we'd like Castep to do. Uh, I call this my aspirational cartoon because we're not quite there yet. You do need to know a bit more technical knowledge in order to use Castep efficiently, which is why we run training workshops. But the idea really is that you should be able to take the chemical elements and where they are and give those to Castep along with what I've called here a quantum physics model. We'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that uh, in a moment. And then Castep should be able to tell you where the atoms really are, what the electronic properties are, what the vibrational properties are, the dynamical properties of the material. Everything else should just emerge from the system. So we would like to, you to, as a scientist to be able to just say, oh, there's carbon in there. I think it's roughly there and there's this stoichiometry, and there's some silicon in there, and there's some, I don't know, magnesium in there, and Castet will tell you what the crystal structure is and what the properties are. That's what we'd like. Now, the way we're doing the quantum mechanics is with density functional theory, and the key in density functional theory uh, really, well, firstly, the full interacting Schrodinger equation is very difficult to solve. It's very difficult means difficult to think of a method that you could do really at all for any interesting system and computationally very challenging using a lot of compute power to do even with the advanced methods like, for example, quantum Monte Carlo. DFT comes from a mathematical link between two different systems. One of them on the left here is the many body quantum mechanics, the interacting electrons in the potential from nuclei, and that has a particular ground state energy and electron density. And then on the right, there's a system where the electrons don't directly interact with each other, they interact only with the uh, electron density effectively, the average position of the electrons. And they move in the potential of the nuclei and an additional potential. Because these electrons don't interact directly, their wave functions are uh, decoupled in some sense. So we can solve them with, with single particle-like quantum mechanics. And effectively, that means that the computational cost goes from scaling exponentially with the number of particles n to scaling as a polynomial of the number of particles n. In principle, the computational cost could even be linear for uh, insulators, but in practice, in most uh, conventional codes anyway, it, the cost scales cubically. So it's much better than exponential, but there is still uh, a cost that increases cubically with the number of electrons in your system. Now, this is the scheme of density functional theory that uh, was proposed by Cohn and Sham. And in Cohn and Sham, what we write is that the the real kinetic energy plus the real electron-electron interaction is equal to what I've called the non-interacting kinetic energy. So the, the in kinetic energy that these sort of single particle electrons have, the ones that don't see each other directly, they only see the charge density, uh, the electron density, plus this electron-electron term, which now is uh, sort of non-interacting, I'm just interacting with the density, and then I said there was an extra potential, and that potential 
encapsulates all the physics that we've missed out of the non-interacting picture. So that is mostly the fact that in a real system, electrons are correlated, they move in a collective motion, and also that there are quantum particles and there's quantum mechanical exchange between them. And so this extra potential is called the exchange correlation potential, or in this case, I'm looking at the energy functional, and it depends on the electron density. And the electron density is related to the single particle wave functions, psi of r, just as the modulus squared of psi of r for each of these single particle states, and then I add them all up. So all I have to do is solve the cone sham equations, which look very much like single particle Schrodinger equations. So this is a time independent formalism. So I've said H psi equals E psi. And the only thing that really changes is that H, my Hamiltonian now has this dependence on the density. So I've written H directly here. This is a cone sham Hamiltonian. I've got single particle like kinetic energy operators. So that's just this, uh, minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative. Then I've got this electron electron term, which interacts with the charge density. I've got an electron nuclear term, because obviously there is something holding these electrons together. And then I've got this exchange correlation uh, potential here which depends on the density. And all I have to do now is solve this equation for enough states that I can put all my electrons in there. Now there's a bit of a catch which you might have spotted, which is in order to get my Hamiltonian, I need the density rho, but I showed you that the density rho depends on uh, psi squared. What's psi? Well, that's what I'm trying to solve my equation to find out. So if I don't know psi, I don't know rho. And if I don't know rho, I don't know the Hamiltonian. And if I don't know the Hamiltonian, how on earth am I going to solve an equation with it to find out what psi is? So I've got a cyclical dependence here. So what's typically done is we guess either a density or a, or a potential, usually by putting some kind of blobs of charge where the atoms are. Then I solve this equation with that guess density. So I construct the Hamiltonian for the guess density. And that gives me some wave functions. And then from those wave functions, I can compute an improved estimate for what the density is. And I keep going round until my improved estimate for the density was indistinguishable to within some tolerance to the density that I actually put in. And that's when we say the equations have been solved self-consistently, and this is known as the self-consistent field cycle. So when you run any DFT calculation, uh, it will go through what they call self-consistent field cycles or SCFs. And if you look at cast of output, you will see that the energy has a little uh, arrow at the end and it says SCF. And you can have a look at the SCF uh, tag at the end and see how your system is converging to the ground state. The only catch with this is this last term, VXC, because unfortunately we don't know what that is. It's unknown. But what we can do is we can work out what it is for some physical systems, typically quite simple systems, and we can use the exact answer for those simple systems as an approximation to the answer in my actual system that I'm interested in. This isn't as bad as it might sound because typically only about a tenth of the total energy of my system is coming from the exchange correlation term. So it's high enough that we have to worry about it. But it's a small enough fraction that actually we don't have to get it exactly right. One of the simple systems that we might consider is if electrons are just completely uniformly spread through all space, with the uniform electron gas or the homogeneous electron gas, then we can compute this contribution. And we could use that as an approximation to the actual EXC in our calculations. There are more advanced approximations to this. This was one of the first ones that get, got us anywhere. This is known as the local density approximation. If you're in the field, you know there are many, many improvements to this. This is the sort of grandfather uh, of them all. And in CASTEP, we support the local density approximation and also 
approximations that use the gradients, so the generalized gradients. You can use meta GGAs, and a particularly uh, successful one in recent years has been the regularized, strongly constrained, and appropriately normed functional or R scan, which is less of a mouthful. DFT has a small problem, or sometimes a large problem, with very localized states. The localized states the uh, interaction, the electrostatic interaction could be too high and it can give those states too much energy and it could lead to them being delocalized. And there are a number of ways of addressing that. One is to directly localize them by bringing in um, some physics from a different area, uh, Hubbard physics from the strongly correlated materials modeling community. And you could do that, for example, with the DFT plus U method. And that is a way of relocalizing, for example, D states or F states that are over delocalized in DFT. We could also go to non local exchange correlation functionals, which in CASTEP we call NLXC. Um, if quantum chemists will be very, very familiar with the first one, Hartree Fock, which is not actually very good for a material, but it's a good starting point when you're writing NLXC. Of more use in a material is to take the Fock exchange and to screen it, which adds the effect of correlation in the material into it. And this is a very effective way of modeling, for example, band gaps in materials, which just interpreting the bands that you get out of Tonesham DFT does not give you a reliable band gap prediction. The band structure actually tends to be good, but the band gap itself is not. There are many more functionals in the literature, many of which CASTEP supports. I've just highlighted uh, one of the HSE functionals, which is uh, particularly popular in hybrid functional modeling and device material modeling. Those functionals, one of the reasons I'm mentioning it, they are computationally very demanding and they change the workload that CASTEP has um, and uh, that has some implications for the kind of calculations that you might do on a large HPC facility like Young or like Bead or like CSD3. Okay, but just to go back to the kind of things you need to worry about when you do a cast up simulation, if I'm doing a material, normally the atoms are arranged periodically. So here's my cartoon periodic material. And uh, what we normally do is we pick a periodic repeating unit, a unit cell. So I've picked just a rectangular one here. And we focus our computational efforts on just simulating the potential and the density in that cell. And this is all relying on Bloch's theorem. So for a quick recap, oh, I've forgotten. Here's, here's how you actually demonstrate, here's how you actually tell CASTEP the unit cell. So CASTEP has two input files, one called dot cell. So you, you give it a name, uh, my calculation, and you add dot cell. And in there goes a definition of the crystal lattice. You can either give the lattice vectors, or it's often quite convenient to give just the three lengths and cell angles. So I've done that with the lattice ABC block in CASTEP's input file. It's just a plain text block. Um, 5.43, 5.43, 5.43, that's a, a reasonable estimate of silicon's cubic lattice constants, and 909090 90 because it's a cubic cell, but you can put whatever angles or lengths you like. By default, the units of length are angstroms. You can change that, so there's an optional first line that I haven't put here where you can change the length unit. And then the positions you can either give in absolute coordinates, positions, abs, block, or you can give them in fractions. And we also support both decimal fraction, uh, decimals and direct fractions. So I could have said a half, a half, zero, for example, on line two. And the format is simply chemical element and then the 3D fractional positions, or if it's absolute, then um, position in angstroms. You'll notice a mixed up case and lower case. This is just to illustrate that it doesn't matter. You can, the case doesn't matter. Uh, you can even, if you're so inclined, have uppercase for part of the word. Um, it looks weird, but Castor is quite happy. And the order of blocks doesn't matter either, but please don't nest the blocks. Uh, that causes Castor to get very confused. 
Okay, so we're going to try and focus our effort on the uh, this unit cell, this uh, the, the periodically repeating part. And Bloch's theorem helps us here. Bloch's theorem says that if we have periodic atoms and therefore period, a periodic potential acting on the electrons, that the density of those electrons will be periodic and will have the same periodicity as the uh, unit cell. The wave functions don't have that periodicity necessarily. The wave functions are allowed to change their phase, not the magnitude, but their phase. So it's conventional to write the wave function as something which only has a phase, e to the i k dot r here, and then a block function which is perfectly periodic in all respects. So in other words, the magnitude and the phase is periodic. And um, if you may come across the term k points, this is the k that they refer to. And we need to make sure that we have chosen these phases for the wave function appropriately. What does that mean? Well, in principle, you need to choose all the phases within the first Brillouin zone of the crystal. So I'd have to, and I have to integrate over the result, but that would involve infinite computational effort. So we're quite keen to avoid that. Fortunately, the states that you compute with different wave vectors only depend fairly weakly on that wave vector. So these U of R's don't depend very strongly on K. And that means that instead of an integral, I can actually approximate that as a sum. So you pick whatever you're interested in. I've picked the density here. So rho of R ought to be an integral over all these Ks of the mod psi R squared that comes with each of those Ks. But I instead approximate those with the sum of the mod of psi R squared at some discrete Ks. The Ks I've chosen, as I mentioned, are called K points. And of course, I need enough K points to get accurate results. So what I do is I increase the number of K points and I see what happens to my calculated property. So here's an easy property to plot. This is the ground state energy. This one's actually for diamond. Um, it's primitive cell. As I've gone from, now this is 3D system. So the K points are 3D grid. So on the bottom, I've plotted, if I say four, what I mean is a four by four by four grid of K points. So conceptually, that's 64 points that I've sampled, 64 choices of phase. And I've uh, done my integral over K by adding, basically averaging over those points. In practice, we can use crystal symmetries to reduce the number of points we've actually got. All you do in CASTEP is you add the keyword symmetry underscore generate into your cell file. CASTEP will look at the symmetries that you've got and reduce the K points uh, appropriately. To set the K points at all in the cell file, you just say K point MP grid, MP because this is known as a Monkhurst pack grid. So if you look at one of CASTEP's cell file inputs, it just says K point MP grid 444. Or if you prefer, you can say K point MP spacing and you can give a spacing. So you want the points to be uh, no further than that apart in reciprocal space. So you have to think about what that means, one over angstroms. And actually the unit in CASTEP is two pi over angstroms. So if you are doing spacing, you need to remember that the unit of measurement is 2 pi over angstroms by default in CASTEP. OK, that's the K points. The last sort of bit for this is what do I use to represent those U of R's, the block functions? And you could choose sort of real space points, or you could choose polynomials or Gaussians or atomic orbitals. And you will find codes, particularly for the latter two in quantum chemistry, that do Gaussians and atomic orbitals. And sometimes even for material simulations too, where they take the periodic arrays of Gaussians or atomic orbitals. But in CASTEP, we go back to the simplest periodic basis set, which is the plane waves or Fourier basis set. So the plane waves are e to the i, g dot r, where g is a wave vector 
that he's chosen to have the periodicity of my crystal. So I've written U of R as a Fourier sum. So I've got a complex coefficient here, C, G, K, um, because at every K point, the coefficients are different. And for each of my plane waves, I have a different coefficient. And the Gs, only certain Gs are allowed because this, these have to be periodic with my unit cell. Each of the ig dot r, if you were to plot it, um, is a, a plane wave. In other words, it's a wave that travels in, in real space. It goes perpendicular to g, and the wave front is a 2D plane. So that's why they're called plane waves. And this sum goes over all possible reciprocal lattice vectors, all of the wave vectors that have these uh, periodicities. But actually, they're an infinite number. And this is just the same as if you look at uh, the harmonics in a, in a room, for example, there's a fundamental frequency, which is where there's only half a wavelength in the room. And then as there's a harmonic, which is one wavelength in the room, and then there's an, an extra harmonic, two wavelengths, three wavelengths, four wavelengths, as I go up. And actually I can have any integer number of wavelengths in the room, the room supports those sound waves and exactly the same way, my unit cell has an infinite number of plane waves that with that perfect periodicity. So this looks like I need an infinite number of plane waves, but fortunately that isn't the case. Fortunately, I only actually need to inclu include plane waves up to a certain magnitude of wave vector. And because the magnitude of the wave vector squared is related to the kinetic energy of those plane waves, we often call that a kinetic energy cutoff, so or a plane wave cutoff energy. So we define a cutoff energy and we only include the plane waves less than that cutoff energy. And if I plot that, so my allowed uh, wave vectors are plotted in 2D here, they're the points. And then if I say I'm only including ones with a certain magnitude or less, that traces out uh, a circle in my 2D illustration, but a sphere in 3D, and that's known generally as my, as my cutoff sphere. And it would have way more uh, G vectors in it than this cartoon. And again, this is a convergence parameter of the calculation. So I've got to ensure that this plane wave cutoff is high enough to give you accurate results. So in principle, you recalculate with higher and higher cutoff energies until your properties converge. Now, of course, there are tools that let you do that. CCPNC have developed the CASTEP conv tool that you can use to do this, but it's also fairly easy just to script it yourself, which can be good when you're starting out just to see how everything changes with respect to the cutoff energy. Here I've plotted the calculated ground state energy for a particular material as I increase the number of plane waves. So on the horizontal axis is this axis is the number of plane waves effectively. As I, as I increase this cutoff energy, I include more plane waves. And then the vertical axis is what my computed energy is. And you can see that it converges fairly nicely in an exponential like manner. There are good mathematical reasons for that. And you might decide that that was fairly well converged at perhaps 350 or 400 electron volts. But the reason I've plotted this is because this is a cautionary tale. No experiment directly measures the energy, the, the ground state energy. They all measure energy differences or changes in the energy when you do something to your system. So a better thing to compute would be something related to how this energy changes if I perturb my system. And one that I find useful is the, the stress or the pressure on your simulated cell. If I plot that here, the pressure in GPA, so gigapascals, this is the same system. You can see that whereas I thought I was converged at 350 EV and maybe 400, actually I'm quite a long way from being converged. So 350, I'm still on this very, very steep bit where actually the pressure is depending very sensitively on the cutoff energy. I haven't got enough plane waves at all. I need to increase the cutoff energy. I thought 400 might be enough, but no, 400 is actually near a maximum of the pressure. I need to go to somewhere closer to 500 EV 
to have accurate results. So you have to be very careful to make sure that your results are converged with respect to your K-point sampling and with respect to your cutoff energy. And when we say your results, we really do mean your results. So whatever it is that you are interested in. Sometimes what you're interested in is incredibly expensive to compute, but there are often good proxies. And one of the reasons why I shown the pressure here is that a good, this is a good proxy for mechanical properties and vibrational properties. So instead of computing the phonons, for example, with uh, perturbation theory, you could calculate the pressure and you could do your convergence checks with the pressure. And that reflects very well how the phonons will uh, converge with cut of energy and K-point sampling without having to do a full 3N perturbations to calculate all of the phonons, only to discover that you didn't use enough K-points or you didn't have too low a cut of energy and that all goes in the middle. The last piece of the puzzle in terms of making a workable density functional code with plane waves is that if you do what I've just said, the plane wave cut of energy you need is actually very high. Killer electron volts for many elements. As you go from hydrogen up to carbon, you typically get plane wave cut of energies that go from one killer electron volt to 12 or 13 killer electron volts. That's a huge cut of energy. That's a lot of plane waves. It takes an extraordinarily large amount of compute time. But actually, the reason you need such large plane wave uh, sets is because these high G vectors, the G vectors with very large magnitude, are describing the wave function very accurately as it varies near the nucleus. And near the nucleus, you've got the Coulomb interaction between the nucleus and the electron, and it's changing very rapidly in space, and it's going to minus uh, infinity, basically. But actually, that bit of the potential is not scientifically very interesting in most experiments, because in that part, the potential is so strong, the electrons only really see that potential. They don't really notice the chemical environment that they're in. They don't really notice any fields that you apply. So um, actually, they don't affect chemistry or electronic properties or vibrational properties very much. There are some exceptions to this, but uh, generally speaking, they don't affect that. So what I could do, you could think of this as I could pre-compute what the core electrons doing, these electrons that are very, very close to the nucleus and what they're doing in this region. And I could just use uh, that as a pre-computed thing. And then I could calculate the potential, not the bare Coulomb potential, but the potential that outer electrons feel between the nucleus and these core electrons as a composite particle, an ion. So if I actually plot this for, this is copper, this is one of the states in copper, and I've just plotted the radial part of the wave function. So the nuclear Coulomb potential, here we are looking like minus something over infinity. And the wave function you can see is nice and smoothly varying a long way from the atom. But as I get towards the nucleus, it starts having some very short wavelength oscillations and short wavelength means a very large wave vector. So this is what's driving my high cut of energies. And this is a 3D state. The 2S and the 1S also would have very rapid oscillations in this core region near the nucleus. So what I do is I exploit the fact that near the nucleus, actually the chemical properties aren't very sensitive to that. And we replace the Coulomb potential with a modified potential we call a, a pseudo potential. I don't actually have the freedom to do any potential I like, but I'm not going to go into the details, but there is a very rigorous mathematical framework that shows what constraints you have on a pseudo potential for it to have the same physical properties as the Coulomb potential, because you can't just have anything. But that's the basic idea. So we replace this strong Coulomb potential with a weaker potential to get this modified potential, this pseudo potential, it means that the wave function we compute in CASTAB, we compute explicitly, doesn't vary as rapidly in space. And that means I can use a smaller cut of energy. And you may be wondering, well, how can I get away with this? I've, if I remove some of the core region, maybe I've removed some core electrons, 
Um, if I take a 1s and all the 1s electrons out, doesn't everything else just drop down to the 1s state? And you're right to worry about that. That's one of the things that we have to be careful when we construct a pseudopotential, that it has the right electronic states with the right energies. But we can do that, and that's well-established procedure. I can generate a pseudopotential, and here's the pseudopotential in blue compared to the Coulomb potential. And typically what you do is you specify a distance from the nucleus at which these two are essentially identical. Uh, that's often called the, uh, the, the cutoff radius or the core radius of your pseudopotential. And then inside that radius, you've changed the potential. And so you can see here that whereas the Coulomb potential goes to minus infinity, the pseudopotential goes to uh, a fixed value. And there are some other uh, parts to this called non-local projectors, which take care of the energies and the scattering and other properties of the atom and make sure that this pseudopotential generates all of the correct properties that I'm interested in. And I also want to mention here that this is true of uh, all the pseudopotential schemes. You will hear people talk about norm conserving and ultra soft and projector augmented wave PAW potentials. They all follow this. There are differences in the detail, but they all do this. So uh, in theory, they can all give you a lower cut of energy and still recover all of the properties. Just to be extra confusing, there is also a way to recover what all the core states are doing. So if you like to put back in this pre-computed core electron behavior, and that's called a PAW, projector augmented wave reconstruction. It's actually not the same as the projector augmented wave pseudopotential. So when people talk about PAW, there are two different things they're talking about. Um, one is whether you reconstruct what core states are doing in the core properties. And the other is whether you have used that similar machinery to you as your pseudopotential. Okay. In CASTEP, we do the PAW reconstruction when you need the core states and their properties, but we don't actually do PAW pseudopotentials. We do ultra soft pseudopotentials. This came from the group of David Vanderbilt uh, or norm conserving potentials, if you prefer. If you don't know what that words mean, those words mean, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm talking to people who, who uh, worry about those things then, but you're welcome to ask me about it later. The point of replacing this, of course, was to try and have a smoother wave function. So here's the actual change in the wave function. In red, we have the original wave function. Okay, you can count the nodes. Uh, you can work out what the principal quantum number was, if you're so inclined. And my pseudo wave function, you can see is much smoother. It's now nodeless, but it's still chemically the same state as the original one. So it's slightly weird um, if you've come from a chemistry background, but now the principal quantum number, if you like, um, it, it, we've changed how many nodes uh, N and L give you in a slightly weird way with pseudo potential. But we've done it in a, in a careful, mathematically rigorous way, so we do get the correct chemistry. Um, now, there are lots of different pseudopotentials out there, but CASTEP comes with a, a library of pseudopotentials and a pseudopotential generator built in to CASTEP. So the easiest way, well, literally the easiest way is just not to mention pseudopotentials and CASTEP will generate them for you. Um, but often a lot of people want a little bit more control. So for example, there are a set of libraries, the CASTEP 19 set, for example. So this was the one that we first released with CASTEP version 19. In your cell file, you say percent block species pot for the, the potential of each chemical species. And if you say C19, then it gives you the CASTEP 19 set for whatever elements you've got. Now, there are times when you might have a pseudopotential in a file that you want to use. So you can tell it that instead. So you can list the chemical elements here, I've given silicon, and then a file name. So I've silicon underscore PBE, because I use the PBE potential to generate this. And it was an ultra soft pseudopotential in the USP format. USP format, just slightly confusingly, can also be used for non conserving pseudopotentials. Uh, but um, you can call it whatever you like that file. And you could list that one per element. 
if you missed an element of cast up will just generate the pseudo potential. Cast up will generate the pseudo potential with whatever exchange correlation functional use you wanted for the main calculation, if it can. But there's a surprisingly large number of exchange correlation functionals that are actually very poorly behaved in vacuum. And so generating the pseudo potential we do with uh, one atom in vacuum and not all exchange correlation functionals actually will generate a reliable, stable pseudo potential. So as an example, if you were to choose the PW91 exchange correlation functional, cast up will use PBE to generate the pseudo potential because it's much better behaved, but the functionals are actually very similar. So we've not had a problem with that. But you do in general need to make sure that your pseudo potentials are consistent with your main calculation. Otherwise, you're treating your core electrons with one exchange correlation model and your valence electrons with a different model, and that's not a consistent calculation. As far as we can, cast up just takes care of that for you. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of DFT and where CASTEP comes in and the choices that we've made in CASTEP. We use what's generally known as the plane wave pseudo-potential approach. And there are four big codes that do this, ABINET, CASTEP, Quantum Espresso, and VASP. So if you're familiar with any of those, I've probably just told you what you already knew, um, but perhaps with a little CASTEP flavor and how you actually tell CASTEP how to do those things. The main take home message is that there are two user level parameters, if you like, numerical parameters, the cutoff energy and the K point sampling that you as a scientist are responsible for. You need to converge your calculations with respect to that. And essentially, you just increase the cutoff energy and you increase the K point sampling until the, cal the properties you're interested in, as calculated, uh, are converged. In other words, the difference between successive um, estimates of those is close enough for your scientific goal. The good news is that cutoff energy and K-point sampling are almost independent of each other. So you don't need to, for example, do all of the cutoffs for all of the K-points. You can generally do your K-point convergence and then your cutoff convergence or vice versa. And then only when you've decided what your cut of energy choice and your K point choice, uh, uh, what those choices are gonna be, do you do the calculation that does that cut off with that K point? The only real exceptions to that are if you start with a really, really bad choice. So for example, you start with the K points, just one K point, which is not going to be good sampling at all for any small real space cells. Um, but it can lead to you not actually modeling the right material. Silicon, for example, if you take a, a primitive cell and you sample at the gamma point, it will be metallic. And that's not a failure of the density functional theory, that's just that you've done such a coarse approximation, you've got a different material, really. We use pseudo potentials to reduce the cut of energy that you need, and they also reduce the number of electrons, which is also good because you've pre-computed the electrons that spend all their time in the core region. And the ground state we find with this iterative self-consistent field method, SCF cycles. So what do we need to do and how do we use a large HPC machine like Young? Well, one of the things that CASTEP needs to do is to go between the representation of these coefficients in plane waves, this 3D Fourier basis, and sometimes I need to know that's, that's good, but how does the wave function vary in space? So I need to be able to go between the reciprocal space, coefficients depending on G, as I called it, to real space, coefficients which depend on R. And to do that, I have to do all-to-all -all communications if I've distributed my plane waves over lots of different cores uh, in Young, for example. And all-to-all -all communications are quite expensive. And we've recently put quite a bit of effort into this. So the next version of CASTEP will have reworked parallelism. So the next version will be CASTEP 24, which come out very early next year. The typical time that you will get 
as you increase the, the core counts, and I apologize, I didn't redo this on Young. This is, a, this is an Archer calculation. This is for a, a sapphire surface. So this came from a, actually from a catalysis project where we were looking at um, adsorption on sapphire. This is the behavior you get from Castep. The dashed line is if you use MPI only. So if you used any HPC facility, you almost certainly have used MPI. Um, the message passing interface. And I get this dashed line. And the important thing is, as I increase the number of cores that I'm using, the time goes down to start with. But each time I, as I increase the number of cores, it goes down, the time goes down, and then it goes down a bit less, down a bit less. And then at some point, actually, I've thrown more cores at the system then it can efficiently use. And so what's happened is the time has actually increased. This is obviously bad. So I'm using more compute resource and I'm also waiting longer for my results. Now, this is a known problem. This has been known for many years. And one thing that we did about 10 years ago is add what's called shared memory parallelism uh, using a technology called OpenMP. So I'm using OpenMP and I'm using four threads so that each MPI process now has four threads. So you can think of it as that each MPI process can use four cores now. And roughly speaking, I get to take the slightly horrible parallel scaling curve and move it so I use, uh, multiply all those processes by four. So I'm now getting it so that I can efficiently use uh, several hundred up to a thousand and processes on Arch2, for example. And this is particularly important when you have lots and lots of cores per node. And that's because all the cores on a node will share one or two network interconnects. I'm delighted to say that uh, Young and Bead don't suffer from this quite so much because they don't have so many cores per node. But Archer and uh, some of the CST3 machines do have this problem because you have uh, for example, on Archer, 128 cores, all sharing just a couple of links to the network. So when all those cores need to talk to all the cores on all the other nodes, there's a lot of uh, fighting for who gets to use the network. And that slows the communication down and leads to this, this problem here. As I said, we recently revisited this and, and optimized this. And so what you should see in CASTEP24 is the behavior in the, in the turquoise line here, where we can get much more efficient use out of actually all of the uh, calculation, but particularly you'll notice that it scales better. So we can use uh, much, uh, many more cores efficiently or the same number of cores, but, but much more efficiently. So the simulation time goes down. And in practical calculations, we've seen um, speed ups of uh, 40, 50, 60%, even up to a factor of three in one case, just by optimizing the communications and working a lot harder about minimizing communications and being cleverer about what the communications we have to do. Time is a little bit difficult to see how well that is. So I've plotted this in speed and um, speed as in how many these self-consistent field cycles to, you get every second. So here you'll see this, this is the same data as on the previous graph. So with the new method, you'll see that the speed, as I increase the number of processes, the speed goes up and it's much closer to linear, which is what you'd hope. You'd hope that as you increase the number of cores, the speed you see goes up uh, with the number of cores. So the emphasis of this has been on the scaling um, but actually, we've tended to find it's faster on all core counts. So even though Young didn't have such a problem because there aren't so many cores per network link, we find that it is faster even there. It's even faster on workstations. On the particular case that I showed you on 2,000 cores, it's a, effectively a, a, about a 60% speed up. So in other words, um, the time that it, you have to wait has gone down by about a third, a bit more than a third. And the results are absolutely identical using the same compute resource. This is just uh, a free third of your life back. There you are. Okay. 
And I just wanted to say, just we're kind of wrapping up this bit, and now we're going to talk about um, the GPUs in a moment. But I just wanted to see if I can get this to work. Oh, maybe I can't. I, including an image, uh, an animated GIF, which is refusing to work over Zoom. OK. Well, I won't describe what you would see if it worked. That seems a, <laughs> a little bit pointless, but maybe we can take some questions on the, the basics of cast up now. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen just for a moment. And then while we're doing that, um, my colleague, Matt Smith, will get uh, his GPU presentation ready. We'll get ready to, and we'll, we'll do that as a second part. Um, but for now, I will pause. And has anybody got any questions? Oh, hang on, we've had one in the chat. That is, can you mix on the fly with? Yes, you can. You can mix. Uh, you can mix pseudo potentials to your heart's content. Um, you shouldn't mix them with different exchange correlation functionals. <laughs> that that way would be a little bit mad uh, because of the physics. Castup will happily do it if that's what you ask. But by default, it, it won't do that. You would have to do, do that. But you can mix on the fly generated pseudo potentials, uh, user generated pseudo potentials. You could use a package such as um, Opium, for example. Um, we've e even got some ability to read quantum espresso pseudo potentials in UPF format uh, once you generate there. Um, so, yes, that's entirely possible. You can mix norm conserving and ultra softs. There's, that's a very compelling reason why you would want to, but but you can. Any more questions? Hey, do we have any other questions? People can in orbit calculation. Can we carry out? Yes, <laughs> you can. Um, so there are some challenges with that, which I think you'll discover that every BFD code uh, is currently facing. So some of the self-consistent field um, methods have some uh, issues when you have lots of degeneracies. And spin orbit coupling calculation, the spin orbit splitting is very, very small in many materials. So you've got near degeneracies. And that can slow down the SCF cycles. So yes, you can do it. Um, but there are some challenges with the convergence for that. With the currently released version, you can only do that with norm conserving pseudopotentials. Um, the ultra soft pseudopotentials is under active development. In fact, I am actively developing them. So I can answer in way more detail than you probably want to know. So maybe that's, we can do some detailed questions later if you'd like to uh, dig into that. But yes, you can do spin orbit coupling calculations with normal conserving potentials. And I should say you can use, for example, the quantum espresso um, spin orbit pseudo potentials for that as well. That's one of the useful things. We've been benchmarking results across all the codes and just making sure that we all agree that on what the answer is. Do you have other questions? People are free to shout out. Okay. Ah, well, oh. well, that's an excellent question. So we've literally just finished that two weeks ago. So uh, yes, you can. There is a community. Um, so sorry, for those of you who can't see the chat, the question is, can Castet compute the Hubbard U self-consistently? Yes, um, it's been able to for a while via one of our uh, users developed a Python framework. In fact, a user some of you will know, Bernard Zhu, and um, that's available on GitHub and has been for a number of years. That runs Castet as just as a standalone program and then it, and it computes it. But we've recently implemented that internally in Castep and that will be, so that's gone for a public beta now. If you have access to Castet repository, you will be able to um, see that 
oh, maybe not quite, maybe I need to push that change. But anyway, very, very soon. And in Castec 24, it will still officially be in beta, but we think it's, it's working. So the user interface won't be quite what we want it to be, but the capabilities will be there, yeah. Uh, Mark has asked whether the academic and industrial versions, how they compare, they're identical. It's the same code base. It's literally the same code base. Um, there, there aren't any differences at all. And actually, that reminds me, CastUp is free for non-commercial use um, worldwide. If you're, um, and so if you if you'd like to try CastUp out, you you're you're very welcome. There is a license shop that STFC run for us. You can go to STFC and uh, order a CastUp license. There's a there is a license file that you need to complete and have authorized by your institution, but there's no money involved. So uh, yes, you get full cast up source code and it's exactly the same as the industrial version. What you don't get is the commercial graphical user interface, but you can use your favorite graphical user interface uh, where if you have the commercial license, you can use Material Studio. If you like prefer Vesta, you can use Vesta. If you want to visualize it in Jmol or Avito, then, then you, can, you can do all that. But the cast up itself is completely free with source code and that source code is the same as the commercial code base. Okay. All right. Any, any other questions? I, I couldn't hear that. I'm sorry, I can hear someone talking, but I can't hear what they said. Hi, you know, to just, um, I don't think anyone else has other questions as far as I can okay. see. I was just gonna say anyone else, um, feel free to shout out or in the chat. Okay, shall we turn our attention to GPUs? All right, now let me uh, share my screen again. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, in the room. If someone gives me a thumbs up, you can see the share. That's fine, yeah. Yes, excellent. All right. Which mic are we on? This one. Sorry, excuse us. Over to you, Matt. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? It's booming in the room, but um, I don't know about, on the Zoom, is it okay? It's fine. Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Um, well, as, uh, as Phil said, uh, he's handing over to me for the, um, the GPU part of the presentation. My name's Matt, uh, Matt Smith. I've worked on the um, Castep uh, GPU port for um, the past five or more years now, um, and I've, uh, this work has been done not at all in any sense on my own. Um, I've worked with Phil very closely and also with um, Ian Tamiris um, and a host of other people who I'll mention at the end, but you can see um, our, the main people here on the, on the opening slide and our affiliations. So I'm going to give you like a whistle-stop tour really through the uh, Castep GPU development, what the motivation was for it, what our aims were, the performance so far that we've got, what features we, we're supporting of um, normal Castep, uh, as, as in Castep CPU, and, um, and also what we're looking forward to in the future. Um, so I'll now press it up here. Uh, so first of all, what's the motivation? Why would you be interested in Castep? GPU, well, the obvious uh, reason for this is for speed. GPUs speed things up. That's, that's their entire purpose, really, in, in terms of um, computation in uh, high performance computing. And when we talk about speed in CASTEP, what we're really interested in is uh, two main things um, highly parallel compute intensive 
kernels. So we're thinking about anything like matrix multiplications, which there are, are a lot of in Castet. Also any um, nested loops, any dense computation there. And also memory bandwidth bound kernels. And in particular, we're thinking of fast Fourier transforms when it comes to um, Castet. So a lot of the work that we've done has targeted matrix multiplications, loops, and fast Fourier transforms. And that's where the majority of the um, speed up where the acceleration comes from. Uh, in terms of the limitations to acceleration, the primary, the sorry, the primary uh, limitation is data transfers to and from the CPU. Castep isn't a, uh, a code that has one large kernel that you can just put on the GPU and accelerate the entire program, as you might find in a molecular dynamics code, for example. Con plane wave contram DFT just isn't, um, isn't that way. So we have a lot of data transfers. That's a limiting factor. Um, another motivation for the GPU port is simply the availability um, of GPUs. Uh, heterogeneous uh, high performance computing systems are becoming well, I, I was going to say more popular, they're really becoming the norm, the de facto norm in HPC, um, where a large fraction of the computation is expected to be performed on the accelerators, on GPUs. So you may well find that the CPU side of things, um, they tend to be lower powered than perhaps a than they would have been maybe five or 10 years ago, because the the majority of the heavy lifting is intended to be done by the accelerator or, or multiple accelerators. Um, so the ubiquity of um, GPUs means that CASTEP GPU is um, somewhat of a necessity in that sense. And also, um, if we think about uh, towards exascale um, computing, um, the probability is that exascale doesn't mean that we run one large calculation at exascale that may be possible for for some cosmology codes and, and that kind of thing but probably far more likely is that we have multi-software workflows where um, there are different um, length scales different time scales for each bit of software and those those different pieces of software will knit together and um, and be running simultaneously uh, through pipelines on exascale machines and for that kind of um, system Castep, um, a GPU port of Castep becomes an essential part um, because we have to be able to integrate with everything else that's going on in a, in a multi-software workflow. So in that sense, the GPU port future-proofs Castep. Um, okay, so with the motivation done, I'll turn to uh, what our aims were for the project when we set out. We had uh, multiple aims. I've only... I've only um, listed two of them here, but probably the two most important ones, really. Uh, the first is we needed the development of the GPU port to be sustainable, by which I mean that the development that we did um, five years ago and the development that we do today will be able to be maintained and sustained in the future. There's no point in us developing a fantastic uh, GPU port for that runs at whatever speed up you like, um, but then as soon as there's a new uh, version of CASTEP developed, we can no longer support the GPU uh, version. And then that, that GPU version just becomes some relic in some Git repository somewhere that nobody ever uh, is able to run. So the one of the main aims, in fact, I would say really a primary aim really, was to, um, to have a sustainable um, development. And I'll talk about more of what that means in a moment, but in... Um, in simple terms, it means a, a single unified source code. So the, the GPU port and the CPU port are one source code. Uh, they create one binary, they ship as one thing, or they will do anyway, uh, shortly. And uh, yeah, there's just, there's just one code to maintain. Um, also, of course, if we're thinking about acceleration and um, speeding things up, then we're interested in efficiency. So put very simply, this means, can we accelerate CASTEP? which kind of sounds like, a, well, of course you can, if you put it on a GPU, you're bound to accelerate your code. In actual fact, accelerating plane wave DFT is, turns out to be quite a hard thing to do, certainly to get any kind of real meaningful acceleration out of it for various reasons, some of which I'll mention in this talk, but um, there, are, there are a myriad of these um, that I, I won't go into all the detail. But first and foremost, can we actually accelerate Castep? 
Well, you'll see that the answer to that is thankfully yes, we can. Um, but also in terms of efficiency, what we're interested in is um, GPU uh, saturation in terms of compute and or bandwidth, by which I mean, can we get the most out of the GPU? We're not just using it here and there and uh, we're just getting 50% of the performance out. Can we actually drive it to its full capacity? Um, and what can we do as developers to try and get that, uh, that kind of saturation? Um, and then related to saturation is also occupancy. Can we keep the GPU occupied throughout a cast step calculation? So we're not only using it for little parts of the code, but can, uh, or sorry, of the runtime, but can we keep it occupied throughout? And all of these are challenges, um, some of which we've met, uh, I think satisfactorily, others which we haven't, and they're still in development and we're learning as we go along. But uh, as I've said, um, I'll, I'll mention a bit more about these later in the talk. So first of all, sustainability. Um, okay, so in terms of sustainability, the, probably the by far the most important uh, decision we made way back at the uh, beginning of this um, project to develop the GPU port was to take a directives-based approach to the um, to the GPU port. And if you're not sure what directives-based approaches mean, uh, essentially when it comes to GPU porting. Um, you have the possibility just to decorate your code with um, just very simple lines, uh, your existing CPU code. These are directives that will then, all of the uh, transfer and so on to and from the GPU is done by some library or some module, or you can take an explicit language-based approach, CUDA being the most, uh, uh, most uh, common one of these. Um, there are pros and cons with each, but the, the biggest pro for the directive-based approach is that it ensures a single unified source code. There's no way that you can really, well, I suppose there is, but you would have to actually work quite hard to get a divergent code base, uh, unlike CUDA, where you immediately have a divergent code base in effect the moment you start. And um, so we took a directives-based approach, and the directives that are available for um, the GPU offloading are OpenACC and OpenMP. The OpenACC port is the one that I've been most um, involved with, and that's uh, been released recently on beta release. Again, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but there's also an OpenMP port in development, and that's mainly Arin Tamiris's work. Um, but they're closely related. Um, they, they have much the same kind of feature support and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, um, what I'm talking about today is the OpenACC port, but in, in large, in many respects, the OpenMP, it's also relevant to the OpenMP port as well. And in terms of um, how we've gone about actually taking the CPU code and then porting it to the GPU for CASTEP specifically, we've adopted a task-based development cycle. And when I'm, when I'm talking about task-based here, I'm talking about tasks within CASTEP. Uh, if you've got any familiarity with CASTEP, then you'll know that in order to do a calculation, you specify what kind of task you want the, ca the calculation to perform. Um, and I've got a diagram here. Uh, the most, well, in fact, the, the ubiquitous, you can't do anything without a single point energy calculation. This is the, um, the core calculation that CASTEP will always do. And then from this, you can go on and do various other types of tasks such as um, spectral calculation, which you'd use, for example, to get a band structure, to calculate a band gap, and so on and so forth. You can do uh, geometry optimization, which you might want to do to, um, to find the actual uh, structure of the cell that you've just given, if you give it a rough estimate, for example, to start with. Um, you can do molecular dynamics, you can do phonon calculations, you can do uh, magneto resonance, and so on and so forth. And the things that we've got in black boxes here means that we've done extensive GPU porting of these. So the single point energy we've put a lot of um, development time into because it's the core of all of the computation. So that makes sense. We've also put quite a lot of work into um, spectral calculations for band structures and so on. Uh, we've also done some work with geometry optimization and molecular dynamics, but we've yet to really look at phonons or, or other tasks. Uh, these are on the to-do list, which is um, fairly large, but we're getting there one by one. And the important, the important point here from sustainability point of view is that we're doing this on a task by task basis. 
So we can just work through each task as we develop it. We can add it to the list of things that we partially don't know that we've done pretty much completely. And then we can move on to the next. And there's always some synergy as well between these things. You know, you work on one part of the code, it can help you with development in another part. Uh, another thing we've done for sustainability is um, we've developed an extensive infrastructure, which we hope will facilitate development by the community. So um, the Castep GPU port is available um, to uh, is accessible now by developers. And so we're hoping people will take this up as, as time goes on. They develop new features and they think they'd like to accelerate those features. Then all of the infrastructure is there. It should facilitate that uh, that kind of development. You don't need to be a, um, a, a professional GPU programmer to be able to develop and cast it. That's the idea. Um, so, okay, so the sustainability uh, has, has been covered there. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the performance of these tasks in a moment, but um, also talk about the efficiency. And uh, Phil in his talk mentioned um, that there are essentially three parallel strategies that you can use in CASTEP, uh, two in particular, which are K point and G vector, but there's also a band parallelism as well. And the GPU port is integrated with all three of these parallel strategies. So you can run with, uh, you can run the GPU port in serial, or you can run it with MPI, and you can run it with any of the, uh, any kind of combination, hybrid combination of, um, of these parallel strategies. One thing to bear in mind is that the G vector parallelism is limited in terms of we haven't been able to um, satisfactorily GPU port, the memory distributed fast Fourier transforms yet, that's in development. Uh, there are various stumbling blocks with that, which I'll mention briefly at the end of the talk. But um, anyway, th this is similar to other plane wave codes. It's just an inherent difficulty with, with uh, memory distributed fast Fourier transforms, unfortunately. Uh, but one of the things, one of the nice features that we've got is um, automated detection of available GPUs. Um, and assignment of multiple MPI processes per GPU on a node. So if if you're running with uh, any number of GPU, uh, sorry, any number of MPI processes in your parallel distribution, um, then Castet will automatically pick up how many processes that is, how many GPUs are on the node, and then assign the MPI processes to the node. So all of that back end stuff is taken care of. Um, for you, you don't need to you don't need to concern yourself with that at all. And this is a great way of saturating the GPU in terms of compute or bandwidth, because typically in a uh, play wave DFT calculation, you don't have huge data volumes to transfer back and forth to the GPU. But what you can so so if you only had one MPI process per GPU, you may well find that you're not really saturating uh, that that GPU in terms of its com compute or its bandwidth or its memory. But if you have multiple MPI processes attached, then you can get the most out of the GPU in that sense. So you're, you're making the most of this very powerful um, hardware device in that sense. Uh, okay, so efficiency is there and then performance is what everyone's really interested in. And I'm gonna break this into um, two, uh, two categories in effect. Which, uh, as you can see on the title here, we're looking at semi-local exchange correlation functionals in this slide. In a slide in a moment, I'll be looking at non-local exchange correlation functionals. And I'll explain what the difference is um, very briefly, although I think uh, Phil touched upon this as well. Um, but anyway, in a semi-local exchange correlation functional, this is like the standard exchange correlation functionals that you, you typically use. So this is like uh, the local density approximation, GGA, such as PBE, or um, anything that you're using like that, kind of the typical kind of calculations that you're doing. And um, what you'll find for the GPU port is that uh, we, we tend to see something like uh, five to seven X um, speed up with respect to CPU only, running on the same architecture. So for example, on, um, on BEAD, which these calculations were performed on, there's a Power9 architecture. Power9 is a fairly low powered, uh, low performance CPU, but the, uh, the GPU side of things on BEAD is quite powerful with um, uh, Volta uh, GPUs, which are, well, I guess you could say two generations ago now, but they're still, um, they're still, um, they're still powerful machines. 
Uh, and we tend to see this across the board here. And so what we've got here is um, a graph showing on the x-axis, we've got how many nodes of bead we were using. Uh, this is uh, for each node, you have uh, 32 power nine cores and four GPUs, so eight uh, MPI processes per GPU. And on the uh, y-axis, you can see what the speed up is relative to just the power nine on its own. And just for um, completeness, this is a 48 atom system using the um, semi-local PBE functional. And this is 90 K points. So we were using just K point parallelism here. So there's very little communication. So what you're seeing is um, pretty much just pure speed up. There's no kind of, um, there's no deceleration in terms of the MPI processing uh, as, you, as you increase the core count or very little anyway. Um, but you typically wouldn't run a, um, a CPU calculation on a power nine architecture. In fact, you really shouldn't be. If you are doing that, then you're wasting, um, wasting your core hours because power nines are relatively low powered. What you'd probably be doing instead is running on an x86 architecture, such as you might find on CSD3 in Cambridge, for example, um, Intel machines and so on and so forth. And here we see uh, typically a two or three um, speed up, two or three times speed up node for node. Uh, so ah, in fact, the example I'm using here is the 90 cores on Archer 2 versus 30 cores and four V100s on bead. Uh, so you can see that, you know, you've got, uh, I don't know what's that, less than one node on Archer, but it's a, uh, yeah, and, and just, just under one node as well on, on bead. So it's kind of no per no performance there. Um, okay, so that's semi-local functions. As I say, this is the kind of typical speed up we, we'd expect to see. Um, but the other category of interest is, um, oh, sorry, no, before I come to that, uh, talking about the um, the tasks that we were looking at before. So the, the graphs that I just showed you for single point energy tasks, but I also mentioned before that we'd done some extensive porting of spectral tasks, such as the band structures and so on and so on. Um, and here we're looking at the speed up you can see for density of states calculation. And you can see it gives roughly, again, five, five and a half kind of speed up. Uh, we're looking at this is for the same system again, uh, but this is run on uh, bead and comparing with an x86 architecture on Viking, which is um, the University of York's uh, local HPC cluster, or at least the last gen of that. Uh, again, this is just K-point parallelism. And the reason why it's um, decreasing here is just because it's over parallelized from the um, CPU side of things. It's not, a, a, it's not a, an effect of the GPU port itself. Um, so it's consistent with what we've seen previously in the, in the other slide, but for a different task. Okay, so semi-local functionals. Moving on from those um, non-local exchange correlation functionals, and this is really where the headlines are for, for GPU porting for um, plane wave DFT. Uh, and the difference here between semi-local and non-local is that the Hamiltonian takes on this extra additive term, which we call NLXC for non-local exchange correlation functionals. And it's this term that completely dominates the runtime. Uh, for any plane wave DFT calculation when you're using non-local exchange correlation. Uh, the other terms become roughly, what, 5% or so of the, of the runtime. And this, this term just takes up all of the time. Um, the, the payoff is that you can get very accurate band gaps, band structures and so on, which typically LDA or PBE um, might not give you. Um, but the computational intensity becomes very large. Uh, so, porting to the GPU for this, what we tend to see is something like a 10 to 15 X speed up with respect to CPU only. And that's where you can see in this graph here, I've taken a, um, a similar system to what we used before, but slightly smaller um, unit cell here, um, but also uh, now using, instead of the semi-local PBE, I'm using a screened Hartree Fock with some LDA thrown in there for a screened exchange functional. Um, and what you can see in the graph is the speed up relative to CPU. So here you've got um, CPU, the speed up is one because it's relative to itself. And then the initial port that we did some years ago, uh, a somewhat naive port, but it was a first attempt. We could get something like a eight or nine 
uh, time speed up. And then with the help of some guys from NVIDIA and also some more experience and some more development and this, that, and the other, we managed to get a refactored uh, GPU port, and that's given us something like a 14 times speed up on this particular system. And this was the a, ascent, um, uh, a node of ascent on the Oak Ridge um, National Laboratory system. This is the one before the current one, which is Frontier. So this was using uh, a um, what do they call it? Like a, a sort of development node, I'll say, of, of um, Summit, which is naturally they've called Ascent um, appropriately. And this was using just two MPI processes uh, relative to one CPU, uh, sorry, one uh, NVIDIA V100. And uh, so a little old now, this calculation, but we tend to see the same kind of thing anyway with, with the newer um, systems as well. And just to add to the headline here, if, uh, if if this hasn't wet your appetite. Uh, we've also got um, support on the CPU and GPU side for adaptively compressed exchange, which is a way of speeding up non-local exchange correlation functional calculations. This is all being ported now to the GPU as well. And typically what you'll see here is a 20 to 40 times speed up uh, with respect to the CPU for non-local functionals. So if you're in the market for exact, um, or sorry, not exact, but um, accurate, band structure calculations and you're using plain wave DFT, then clearly adaptively compressed exchange in the GPU port may be of interest to you. Uh, okay, so I'll wrap up with just um, what we're looking at for the next steps in the development. Well, as I said before, we've done, um, we're supporting single point energy tasks, we're supporting band structure calculations, geometry optimizations, molecular dynamics, but there's all sorts of other things to do. One of the um, priorities in terms of this is phonon calculations. Um, we're expecting to do this sometime in the near future. Uh, we're also looking at developing the parallelism. As I said before, we've got full support currently for band and K-point parallelism, uh, and the G-vector parallelism is supported, but there are problems with that in terms of bottlenecks, um, with the details of which I won't go into here, but we're actively seeking solutions to that. Uh, and we've, um, we've made some headway with that, which we're, which we're excited about. And we're also thinking about memory optimization. Um, which typically when you were um, attacking multiple MPI processes to the GPU, there's some redundancy in terms of replication of data. There are various things that we can do to ameliorate that. One of which is to look at hybrid open ACC and CUDA or, um, or indeed language agnostic. Uh, developments. That's something that we're actively pursuing as well. And again, we're excited about where that's what that's taking us. Um, and finally, the um, release schedule. Well, I'm pleased to say everything that I've just told you is now available. Um, you can get this from a tarball from the usual, I say usual, it's usual if you know about um, cast effort and so on. Uh, this is the STF, STFC site. Uh, the address is there. You can also access the source code for the GPU development if you're a developer and uh, you've got a Bitbucket um, access. The dependencies for the code are about as minimal as you could possibly get. All you need is the NV, sorry, the NVIDIA NVHPC SDK um, and an FFTW library as well in order to support GPUs, uh, sorry, FFTs on the CPU side of things. But one thing to point out, if you've got a uh, brand spanking new GPU at home on your workstation or your laptop, and it's great for playing games, the chances are it probably doesn't have great double precision support, if any, uh, and that you won't see brilliant performance from cast up on that. So you really need a dedicated uh, GPU with double precision support, worth bearing in mind. And in terms of installation on Young, Bead, Wilkes, um, you'll see that forthcoming, I've perhaps optimistically put in October here, but let, why not be optimistic? Well, let's go with that. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to all of these people and apologies to anybody else we've left out. Uh, as I said, it's been a collaborative effort over several years with many, many people. Uh, and we're pleased with what we've done, but there's a long way to go. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Can we start by just thanking our speakers or both speakers? It's been a brilliant um, overview of, of both the uh, the theory and and the, uh, the the computer background. So, I guess if anyone wants to put questions into the chat or or shout out, um, we can do those now.
things chat. So I'll start with a question then. So I mean, you you mentioned the fact that the double precision support, certainly for for kind of consumer grade GPUs, is is not there. Um, is is there an option to run in single precision and kind of? Um, I, I know there are options where you essentially just delegate parts, less sensitive parts of the calculation to single precision. Is that something you're looking to doing, or can you? Is there flags that you can use to to, to use that option at all? Um, I'll take that one. We, we've we tried. So what I can tell you is that quantum mechanics and single precision is a disaster. So we tried that. So there is a single precision cast depth version. If anybody wants to try it, they really don't recommend it. It gives complete, the answers are awful. Um, we're looking at doing mixed precision, which is, I think, what you were driving out there, Ed. And um, there is some scope for doing that. And there is some scope for being a little bit more ambitious about that and doing single precision, for example, matrix inversion, and then a bit of refinement and double precision, uh, possibly even on the CPU for that. Um, so we've got a few different collaborative projects with different hardware vendors where that would be particularly useful. Okay, and then just... Uh, the, the version, I should say the version you've got your hands on or can get your hands on if you have developer access and will soon get your hands on, on our tier two HPC, um, that will not have the mixed single and double, but that's something we're, we're looking at. And what's the long-term trajectory of these? Because obviously the, the the big thing driving this is is the um, you know large language models, and, and they're obviously higher RAM. So I, I can't imagine that the double precision is going to be a, a priority for the, the next generation of these, right? So the, the kind of single precision might be there to stay, or do you have a sense of whether that's something that's going to change? Or... No, I mean, in fact, the large language models run half precision or, or even <laughs> lower. Yeah, this is, this is an issue. Um, and even if you look at the Ampere models, you know, there are there are server grade cards with actually not amazing double precision performance. Um, NVIDIA are committed to producing double precision cards. Uh, what it may mean is we pay more because the volumes are lower. Um, but a lot of the hardware optimizations do flow through. We just effectively have less memory because, you know, one data item takes twice as much as if we were in single precision and four times as much as half. Um, so, and that means the data transfer times are more problematic. But so far we haven't had a problem on the software side or the availability of hardware, but it does mean that uh, if you want to do materials modeling, the cheaper cards are probably not worth getting. Unfortunately, it would be lovely if that were true. And that's not the message if you're doing lamps, for example, or something where single precision is Good enough. I will just plug the hybrid molecular dynamics methods. So CASTEP in keeping with many codes has machine learning now, and you can do hybrid calculations and some of the machine learning methods will be accelerated for exactly the same reason as the large language models. So that's not something you can use right now, but that's something that is definitely on the horizon for CASTEP, but for the wider modeling field, I think. Um, someone's recommended, do we recommend specific models? The A100s are good, lots of RAM. Uh, that's what, um, and that's what's available to you on, on Young and CST3 have those. Um, the speed ups that Matt showed, some of those were on V100s um, and actually they're still very capable cards. The, the Pascal is the one before uh, definitely showing their age, but the V100s, if you've got them, you can use them. You, you may well find that there are benefits to doing that. Uh, I wouldn't go out and buy any now. The A100s we're finding, yeah, they're quite, quite good. Um, and also a lot more RAM. And so you're a lot less limited in what you can run. And in, in fact, that was the immediate benefit, the more RAM. I think the H100s I've barely run on so far, but again, an increase in RAM is, is very welcome. Any other questions? Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, just, just out of interest. I mean, I, I guess at the moment, the support for GPUs in these codes is past beta, or I mean, is it still experimental, or would you say that it's pretty well, mature? 
uh, ours is a sort of, we, we've branched it as a beta because we've tested it quite extensively, but only in the people working on the GPU code and a couple of people we directly collaborate with. So we're fairly confident somebody will run it and discover um, it will abort and say, no, that's, you, you can't do that on the GPU. We've just not, not caught that. Um, but in what it does, as far as we're aware, it's, it's, does the right thing faster. It's just, you know, it uses the GPU. Um, Matt mentioned that the MD is partially supported. So just uh, one thing, for example, is we haven't accelerated the uh, force calculation. Um, there's no reason for that other than we haven't had time to do that yet. So we'd like to uh, have the force calculations on and then geometry optimization and molecular dynamics will be even faster. A question about Material Studio. Well, that, I mean, that's really a question to Biovia. So this is a commercial distribution. Um, but I, I don't think it's any secret that they are interested in the GPU port. Um, they're very keen to have a, a single code base, which we are also keen on. Um, right now, there are some minor differences, uh, particularly in NLXC. We've had to do a lot of work in NLXC to accelerate on the GPU, and some of that involved some minor re-engineering of NLXC. So there's now a, a kind of a temporary branching, and we're now bringing things back together. But um, I think the, we, we want to keep the same single code base for academic and industrial versions, and we, as Matt said, would like to extend that to GPU and CPU. We'd like that to just be a single code base that does everything. Oh, so, sorry, the question just as a, a follow-up to the previous one, where, where would you report issues? Would you want them on the GitHub in terms of if people find problems? So if you've got, yeah, so this is a, it's a Git repository. It's hosted on Bitbucket. There's an issue tracker there, uh, as long as you badge it. So the current one is on the feature GPU branch. Um, that's the best place for us, I guess. Um, if everyone in the community just emailed me, I don't think I would be able to cope. <laughs> so please try to avoid that. Um, yeah, put them on the issue tracker. And of course, the other advantage of that is you can see what issues other people have reported and that we, we're working on or, we, or there's a workaround or anything like that. If you don't have developer access then um, and, you, and you want to do that, then uh, we can look at opening an issue tracker somewhere that doesn't involve you needing to get developer access. So of course, you're welcome to get developer access if you like. In terms of HPC sensors, so in terms of it being compiled up on, on Young, um, I'm, I'm happy to have that level of emails, an email from uh, MMM Hub and an email from uh, the N8 and an email from Cambridge. That's fine. I can cope with, I can cope with that. It's the uh, 300 licensed UK users or uh, groups uh, that would be awkward. Um, so the one, the one note I had is on your final um, graphs where you were talking about the scaling performance on um, of the of, of the, the, the Fourier transforms, uh, the auto wall communications. Yeah. It was missing the bottom axis on my screen. I don't know if everyone else had that same. Oh, problem. I think I had the aspect ratio wrong. Yeah. Um, um, so that was a. I think that was one to four thousand cores at the top end. Um, okay. Right. I, I get a kind of uh, late performance is four thousand. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I don't have the raw graph here, or I can just no, show that. I, know, I noticed on that you had a good scaling up to 2000, um, which I guess was the middle point. Yeah, so so they went up to, I think that was 256 up to 4096 cores on Archer 2. Okay. Yeah, by 4096, it's it's sort of 30 seconds. It's there, there are some limits to how fast we can make it. Yeah, the nature of the algorithm. Um, Okay, so then if we don't have any other questions, and I, I think we can just thank our speakers. Um, brilliant talk. And so, so the talk will be put on to the um, MMM Hub site. We'll also um, put it now onto the, we've now got the, the shared tier two website as well. So we'll put it on that as well as a shared training. I guess you'll have it up on the um, uh, N8 website as well. As yeah, and um, if once it's up, we'll link to it from the Castec website as well. Everyone can see that. If anyone has any specific questions, um, you, you're welcome to get in touch. We can we can address those. Okay, perfect. Um...